Thank you, Lynn. And um, I guess I should say that I'm going to go to an opposite extreme from Louise Rice's wonderful talk, which so beautifully you know, took us through discrete particular key episodes in Ovid and their translation into Poussin's pictorial idiom. Um, I'm going to say very little about Ovid, but focus instead on the question, on the topic of metamorphosis. And um, in a sense, this will circle around Ovid. And specifically, I want to look at the way that metamorphosis has functioned in modern art, or the way that modern artists have thought of metamorphosis, which I believe is fundamentally different from what we've seen in earlier art or in poetry, because it's not rooted in that idea of the natural world with its constant but familiar transformations, the seed into the plant, the uh, caterpillar into the butterfly. And it, it seems to me that Ovid is rooted in a certain recognition of the world where these changes take place, and therefore you can take stories and project them onto it. Something very different happens in modern art. Nonetheless, um, I'm going to start with an artist who thought at least briefly about Ovid, uh, who is Pablo Picasso. And uh, there's a backstory here, which is that in the late 1920s, I think around 1929, a rich young man from Switzerland named Alexander Skira came to Picasso and said he desperately wanted to become the young man, a publisher of illustrated books, and he could think of no better way to do this than to commission a series of illustrations from Picasso, and would Picasso please agree to provide a series of illustrations for a life of Napoleon Bonaparte? <laughs> and Picasso said something to the effect of, I loathe and despise Napoleon Bonaparte. I would never illustrate such a book. Skira was, who went on to a great career as a publisher, Skira was a little taken aback and apparently said something to the effect of, well, well then, what might you be willing to illustrate? And Picasso apparently said, Ovid's Metamorphoses. Now, the interesting thing about the handful of illustrations, I mean, this book actually came into being. It was one of those luxurious artist editions. Um, is that the interesting thing about it is that essentially none of Picasso's illustrations touch on the themes we've been thinking about today. Uh, I'm showing you here on screen two versions, an early state and then a later state of Picasso's illustration of the theme of the death of Orpheus, which is, of course, a story that we read. There, there are two passages on Orpheus and the Metamorphoses. The first is the heartbreaking tale of Eurydice's death and his attempt to retrieve her. The second one is the story of how he is destroyed by the Maenads, who are not seduced by and calmed by his music as everyone else is. And Picasso, oddly enough, picks out this episode as the one that interests him the most. So you can see him going from a very clean, linear version here on the left to a more elaborately shaded and refined version on the right. Now, this is accompanied by uh, another theme that is, uh, for, I think, from Ovid, the fall of Phaeton. I mean, this would be related to what uh, Louise was just showing us, the Apollo crossing the sky. But this is, of course, the young man who wants to try driving the solar chariot and then falls, you know, can't control it, gets out of control, and ultimately he, he falls, is destroyed by a, a bolt and a uh, thunderbolt and falls out of the sky. You'll notice that it's very similar to the, the death of Orpheus illustrations, that Picasso seems to have been obsessed by the image of a man, or as we'll see in a moment, a woman slumping over, injured, slumping over, falling backwards, uh, seemingly either dying or fainting. And this theme, in fact, seems to have its roots in um, images of the bullfight. And this gets into something peculiar, which I'm not going to dig into in great detail, just mention, which is that of all the different things that you might illustrate in a bullfight, Picasso was peculiarly obsessed by either horses being wounded by the bull or matadors being wounded. The normal sequence of the picadors you know, picking at the bull and then the matador delivering the fatal blow, all the things you might think of 
as typical bullfight scenes, are pretty much completely missing from Picasso's drawings and paintings touching on this topic over a period of decades. Instead, he's interested in the reverse, the, the, the suffering of the, whore, the gored horse, the suffering of um, the, uh, occasionally of a matador, as you see here on the left in another book illustration from the same moment, which I don't think was ever actually published caught on the horns, wounded Torero and horse. Now, this takes us farther and farther away from Ovid, and we, we come back into contact with Ovid and the theme of metamorphosis in a very strange way with the small sculpture on the right, which is called explicitly Metamorphosis and actually predates the book project. This is from 1928. Now, in terms of its particular iconography, um, you see here we have a highly deformed figure with a strange swollen body that stretches out to the left, an enormous foot that we see at the, our lower left, a very tiny pedestal-like foot at our right, um, this head bending sideways and this tiny arm stretching upwards, breasts facing in different directions. This is the sculptural translation, in fact, of a painted image. There, uh, I'm showing you on the left one example of this from 1927, a woman in an armchair. Uh, there are, in fact, three or four different versions of this painting, as well as a, a multitude of drawings. This is from the epoch of what are often referred to as Picasso's monsters, these monstrously distorted figures. Um, this would take us into the territory of, you know, did Picasso hate women? Why did he uh, depict them in this hideous, distorted way? And in fact, if this were a different lecture, I would argue that that is an incorrect interpretation, that these paintings and drawings are about something else. They are about intimate physical contact and the way that it defeats our normal habits of visual perception. Indeed, let me dwell on that idea for a moment. Uh, in addition to the very strange drawing of the figure on the left and the sculpture on the right, you'll notice that the background is divided into a series of colored panels that do not match up with um, the outlines of the figure or the chair she's sitting in or anything else in the environment. And it seems to me that Picasso is taking aim here at a fundamental misconception of classical art. I, that doesn't seem too grandiose a way of putting it. Classical art says to us, the world can be reduced to clear outlines, to enclosed volumes, to things we can perceive clearly. And in their very clarity, there is a kind of beauty. And of course, I mean, we've just seen you know, extraordinary examples of this in Poussin's paintings. Um, Picasso, following in the wake of Impressionism and other modern artists, says that's not actually how vision works. We do not see the world clearly. We see a multitude of little pieces. There are saccadic jumps between mo one moment of vision and another. You focus on something close. You focus on something farther away. The whole idea of an integral figure or an integral object or an integral scene is a delusion. And in Picasso's mind, the real job of art is to recreate this extremely fragmented process of perception. OK, this, this as I said, really would be another lecture. Let's come back to the sculpture on the right. Why is it called metamorphosis? That's not really the subject of the painting. The painting has to do with, as I said, with perception, also sexuality and so forth. Why is the sculpture called metamorphosis? And here, I, I, I need to make a, a big digression to offer a speculative explanation for that title. Uh, I think it goes back to the impact of Darwinism on modern art and modern thought in the late 19th century. And I'm showing you on the left, this is from a 1905 illustration uh, edition of this book by Ernst Haeckel, The Evolution of Man. This is an English language translation. The German original is, is earlier. Uh, this diagram actually shows you what was considered to be a major important proof of Darwinism, um, which was that if you trace back the embryological development, this is Heckel's argument, it's not actually quite true, but let's go with it for the moment. Heckel argued that if you trace back the embryological development of all different species, as they get earlier and earlier in their life, from the you know, tiny little zygote to the very beginnings of the fetus, they look more and more alike. That all, not only does the whole tree of evolution start from you know, some hypothetical ur creature swimming around the ocean two billion years ago, but 
each of us in our own physical evolution from the zygote to the adult, to the child to the adult, relives that evolution. And Heckel had a phrase that's quite a mouthful, um, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, and that I can see a few heads nodding. I think everybody knew this 50 years ago, but the younger generation has mercifully been spared from having to memorize this concept with all those syllables. Um, but what it means is that in the process of ontogeny, of the individual development becoming oneself as an ontology, um, you go through phylogeny, you go through the history of forms, you relive the evolutionary history of your species in your own life. And what Heckel is showing us on the left is the uh, embryonic forms of many different creatures, starting with a little kind of tadpole on the far left, and if you look up at the upper left, you'll see its, its primal state, which is pretty much identical to the primal states of all the other creatures it becomes one thing as we move down in the chart. If you move a few columns to the right, you'll see a baby chicken, and you'll see it starts out exactly the same way in Heckel's drawing, but then it becomes a chicken, and so forth. Then we get to a piglet, ultimately we get to a human being, but all of these things are the same at their root, is the point Heckel is trying to make. This was considered in the late 19th century, century an overwhelmingly convincing proof of Darwinism. It was translated into English, widely diffused, Later generations of scientists have basically argued that it's not true. It's been out of fashion. For some reason, it's come back into fashion in the last 10 years or so. But it was extremely influential at the turn of the century. And the painting, actually, is a colored aquatint you're seeing on the right by the symbolist artist Frantisek Kupka, shows you how this kind of embryonic imagery makes its way into modern art. Um, Kupka starts out in this series of images um, with a kind of Egyptian scene and you're here somewhere in the room, yes, um, of a pond with lotus blossoms. In another version, there's a pure spirit emerging from the lotus blossom. In this version of the image, the spirit is, seen, is symbolized by a small embryo. So we see the birth of the soul in its infantile state that is the potential to develop into anything. Uh, this would get us into questions of metempsychosis, the rebirth, you know, the cycle of rebirth, the rebirth, uh, the rebirth of the soul, and so forth. Now, my argument is that this is the set of ideas that lies behind Picasso's metamorphosis, that this weird, shapeless little sculpture is supposed to remind us of an embryo. And of course, this is in the era when um, Hans Arp and Juan Miro and other great modern artists are making very many embryonic-looking paintings and sculptures and so forth. It's a major theme in art of the 1920s and, and so forth. Um, so that, in effect, Picasso, together with all these other artists, is advancing a theory of metamorphosis, which is that any one of us might hypothetically go backwards in time, retreat to our evolutionary origins, climb down the tree of evolution, and then climb up again, going along a different branch and emerge somewhere else. That the process by which one thing turns into another is not by a god tapping you on the shoulder and saying, you know, poof, you are now a laurel tree, but um, rather by a scientific process of regression and then neo-evolution. And so this sense of the potential equivalence of all living beings is something that is summed up in this rather hideous little sculpture. It's about this big, um, but of you know, great significance uh, on one hand for science and modern art, but on the other hand for uh, uh, Picasso's evolution as an artist in ways that aren't really relevant here. But I want to also raise another kind, of, illustrate another kind of metamorphosis um, that appears in modern art, starting again with Picasso, but an earlier phase, which is with cubism. I, I, I think I fear I'm incapable of giving a lecture that doesn't talk about cubism at some point. Um, here on the left, I'm showing you one of Picasso's first papier collé uh, done in fall 1912, where he's cut out p various pieces of paper into geometric shapes. He's added in a sh bit of sheet music, an earlier analytic cubist drawing of a glass, uh, newspaper headline, he's put them all together, and by magic, they become a guitar. All these little random shapes that could, don't represent anything in particular when combined in just the right way give us the image of a guitar maybe hung on a wall in front of that wallpaper. But if you turn to the image on the right, which is done probably a couple of months later, 
the one on the left is probably October, the one on the right is almost certainly from December 1912, we see the same shapes, the double curve at far left, the rectangle in the middle, and so forth, but now it has become a man's head. And this elucidates a fundamental principle of cubism, which is that paintings don't depend on reproducing appearances. Pictures, you know, from cubism onward, depend on creating a structure which is a, an artistic structure, not an imitation of the real world. And once you've created a satisfying structure, you can attach different details to it. You can put, attach this, attach that, and depending on what you attach to it, it may become a guitar, it may become a man's head, it may become any number of things. Now we see this principle at work, for instance, in the small painting by Juan Miro, and here I want to put in a plug for the Miro exhibition at the Modern, which I just saw last night, which is spectacular. This, this painting isn't in it, but actually the next thing I'm going to show you is. Um, so here Miro takes the kind of cubist head that you see on the left. On the left is a Picasso uh, from the spring of 1912, still in the analytic cubist style with all that lovely Rembrandt-esque shading, uh, but basically a grid and then Picasso is stuck in a pipe, a corn cob pipe, a nose, an eye, various a hat, various things you can sort of make out, and therefore the grid in Picasso becomes a head. On the right, we have a much more schematic grid, a vertical, uh, a set of lines that make the top edge of a square, a triangle at the top, and once again, with the addition of a pipe and a mustache and so forth, uh, the two eyes at either end of the crossbar, this becomes a man's head. So it's a much more poetic, playful, fanciful version of cubism that underscores the way in which a pattern might turn, one, you know, might turn into anything. And we see this even more so in um, Miro's extraordinary drawing, and this work is on view at the Museum of Modern Art right now called The Family. Uh, let me begin with the figure on the far left with the sort of upside down triangular legs. If you look carefully at the structure of that figure, you'll see that it's exactly the same as the structure of the head of a peasant, the, the upright, the top of a rectangle. It's just that now the things attached to that structure are different, so it's a man standing there with his mustache floating up on his head, his heart, his penis somewhere in between the, the two legs, and so forth. So the same thing might be either a head or a man. But there's, and then there's a woman in the middle, a little child at right, hence the family, the sun seen through the window at the upper left, which is a gigantic eye. But here we begin to get into a different kind of metamorphosis, one that's not dependent on cubism, which is a kind of Freudian idea of metamorphosis, an idea of analogy that, um, if, we look, if you look at the figure of the woman in the middle, she's rather like a plant, so we have in her lower body something that might be either her genitals or the kernel, a kind of seed that is sprouting. Uh, the ball at the top with the little hair sticking out might be a head, but it might also be a flower. So there's a whole realm of natural analogy that opens up here. The sun is like a giant eye in the sky. I mean, we're getting to a different mode. We, we've talked a lot today about the translation between poetry and visual art. Here we have a different mode where a verbal metaphor like the sun is like a giant eye is read, rendered very literally by Miro um, in, in the sun that we see through the window here. Now this idea of, of creating metaphors or equivalences um, goes on to play a very large role in surrealism. And I'm jumping forward in time to 1943 and this drawing that uh, Andre Masson did actually here in New York. This is from a book published in New York during the war called Anatomy of My Universe. Uh, this particular drawing is labeled, is, is titled by Masson, Unity of the Cosmos. And as you'll see, as you can see, it represents a series of figures who are in effect equivalents, the one at the far left biological, the one in the center, a tree form, so that the crotch of the figure becomes a crotch of a tree where two branches meet, the one on the right, mineral. And indeed, Masson and the Surrealists were fascinated by hermeticism, theories of alchemy. You know, this all goes back to Hermes Trismegistus, the idea that there are correspondences among the different realms of being, and that in fact these 
deep mystical correspondences in the nature of things could be used as sources for creating artistic form. This kind of imagery gets picked up, for instance, by Mark Rothko at the point where he's making the transition from being a figurative artist to being an abstract artist. There's a brief surrealist phase around 1944 that I believe is influenced by uh, this drawing and other ones by it by Masson. And there's yet another kind of metamorphosis that now that we've gotten all the way to the 1940s, which you can see um, illustrated here in these two works by Jackson Pollock, except that I am actually misstating the case by describing them as two works. These are the same work. These are the same painting. On the left is an early state of the painting photographed in 1946 at a point where it was apparently called the Little King. As you can see, there are three extremely distorted figures standing side by side. Pollock subsequently, we think in early 1947, overpainted those, er those figures, first with a kind of metallic, shiny paint, conventionally called silver, it's actually aluminum paint, so that he largely obscured them but kept the rhythm of their bodies, creating a more unified pict pictorial plane, and then famously dripped paint, the, you know, the famous drip technique, cream, white, and other colors, um, over the rhythms that he had created, first with the figures, then with the silver paint, until they become something that looks like a constellation, and indeed the painting was called Galaxy, it was retitled Galaxy, and is one of a series of paintings with these astronomical titles, Galaxy, um, Comet, and, and so forth. Um, I think, I mean, this would lead us back into earlier images of star charts and constellations, Miro's co famous constellations of 1941, here, it's, we might pause again and ever so briefly touch ground with Ovid, with the numerous figures, well, not so much in Ovid, but in classical mythology, who die and are then picked up by Zeus and put into the sky as constellations. This is a recurrent trope. You know, who are the constellations? Where do they come from? Often they are young men or women or brothers who loved each other, and then their memory is preserved by placing them in the sky. And this idea of the star chart or the constellation comes back over and over again. It starts with some Picasso drawings in 1924. As I said, comes back in, with Miro in 41, comes back in David Smith's sculpture. It's all over the place. Why? I think it's a system of finding meanings. It's not just the metamorphosis that there might have been a literal person or creature who turns into a constellation, but the thought that the world is full of random things. After all, the actual arrangement of stars in the sky is pretty close to random. But if we stare hard enough at those random arrangements, we can begin to find meaning in them. And this is a fundamental tenet of surrealism. Andre Breton used to speak of objective chance, something that happens to you by accidents, by coincidence, and that yet uh, reveals some deep meaning about life to you, to, you, to yourself. Um, so I think that there's a whole set of ideas, of, of questions about how do you find meaning in the world in this metam what is in fact a metamorphic image, not just in the sense that the painting went through a metamorphosis, that it went from a kind of surrealist figuration into abstraction, as on the right, but also that the image of a constellation is already a metamorphosis, uh, one that runs in both directions, from the recognizable, the figurative, and the clearly meaningful to the abstract, the abstraction of the stars, and then back again from the abstraction of the stars into the realm of human meaning. But I want to now jump ahead in time to much, more, much closer to the present and um, show you a couple of themes that run through a lot of contemporary art where metamorphosis takes on quite a different set of meanings and a different set of forms. One of them is the blurring of the border between the human and the animal. This is a recurrent concern of, of many contemporary artists. On the left, I'm showing you a film still that has been separately framed by the artist, artist Matthew Barney. This is from his famous series of films, the Cremaster films. Um, this one is Cremaster 4, where the protagonist, who is played by Barney himself with very elaborate makeup, as you can see, his ears are becoming like those of a pig. He's, he's turning into a different species here. Um, and he undergoes this weird ritual. He's known as the Lawton Candidate, and he um, 
it ceremonially climbs down through a long kind of tunnel and crawls through it and emerges at the far end as you know has been transformed into a mature something. Um, and of course, one keeps thinking, yes, but what the hell is Cremaster? Apparently, the Cremaster is a little muscle that c controls the lowering of testicles. And this, in fact, has to do with maturation. Male at maturation at adolescence, the testes drop out of um, you know, the torso into the little sacs prepared for them. Um, so we have another kind of metamorphosis here that, is, uh, that Barney is alluding to, or well, alluding to, we, we don't actually see it. Although the, there are automobile wheels with little testicular sacs attached to them, which is somehow a very painful image. Um, on the right, uh, another contemporary artist, Wangechi Mutu, who originally is from Kenya, uh, but has largely made her career here in the United States with these amazing paintings of these half human, half animal figures, uh, wildly distorted um, with the very long legs, often with hooves, with animal faces. And um, I mean, some of what's going on here can be interpreted in a kind of political light. The, the name of this work, as you can see from the caption, is Your Story, My Curse. The, um, I'm trying to remember if this is, I, I considered various different paintings here. So this is the one. Sometimes she'll put in ape-like faces, obviously alluding to racism and the question about you know, Africans being you know, evolutionarily less advanced. So she's confronting these racist stereotypes and, and satirizing them. Um, but there's uh, another way in which um, that's not so obvious. Her imagery, in fact, relates, I believe, I, I don't think this has been written about in the literature yet, but I'm fairly convinced that um, it comes out of a particularly East African kind of imagery. If you look at East African sculpture from the 1950s through the 70s and 80s, and then other painters not nearly so well known as Wangechi Mutu, these extremely long attenuated limbs with the knobby joints and so forth are, in fact, a, a shared cultural style. They are not unique to her, although her use of color is extraordinary and her imagination and fantasy are. So whatever the political message here, there is a, a kind of phantasmagoria of breaking down the barriers between the human and the animal that in some sense you might say takes us back to Ovid and um, characters who are transformed into animals or, or, or vice versa. Um, so this is one, you know, comes back in contemporary art in a very unexpected way. But where I wanted to end with this image and the next uh, two uh, is with the theme of, strangely, a metamorphosis between the body, the classical body, which is here a kind of implicit reference, and its interior. So I mentioned earlier that Picasso and the Cubists and the Surrealists we're challenging the classical idea of the body, saying, no, we don't see it all as a unity that fits into those beautiful classical proportions that you see in Poussin. We have a multiple disjointed view of it. Uh, a more recent group of artists have, have become, this starts in the 80s, have become fascinated with the inside of the body, with the idea that the real truth of our experience is our internal experience. You know, what the doctor tells you when you go in for a checkup is the real truth of who you are. And as you can see, Kiki Smith has labeled this suite of prints. They're, they're very elongated, so I'm only showing you two out of a series of four. She's labeled it, how I know I'm here. So we, she shows us a series of internal organs, um, which you'll notice are accompanied by her face seemingly pressed against the plate of the print, and in some cases her hand. So we have the outside there in the background, and then the internal organs foregrounded. This is, I think, related to her own experience. She worked for some years as an, emer an EMT, an emergen emergency medical technician. So she's you know, intimately familiar with the body under strain, the body in duress, the injured body, and so forth. And this would get us into you know, theories associated with abjection. There's a whole kind of critical literature here I don't want to go into, get into, um, but the idea that this is the real truth of who we are. And then finally, two ways in which this has grown into a kind of new formalism, um, perhaps akin to Picasso's metamorphosis, or, I suppose, really akin to Picasso's metamorphosis, which is the use of these bodily shapes, specifically the bladder, things that look like 
a bladder in your body or like a liver or some other, a lung, um, which have been taken up by an extraordinary number of contemporary artists. So on the left, um, the American artist, Tim Hawkinson, uh, his work Uber Organ from 2000 here installed at the atrium at the IBM building at 57th Street, but I've, I've seen it installed at a number of different places, which as you can see, uh, encompasses these enormous bladders connected by big plastic tubes. And so it's an uber organ in the biological sense of seeming to have bodily organs. It's also a functioning musical instrument. There is in fact a, a kind of keyboard, it's like more like a player piano. There is a roll that goes by and little metal fingers and it plays a series of notes at extraordinarily low tones because the bladders are so big that they're all at the very lower edge of human hearing. So you almost more feel the music than, than hear it in a conventional way. So it becomes a very visceral, tactile experience. And on the right, the um, contemporary Thai artist, Sapi Pitch, who uh, trained in the West but then went back to Thailand and became fascinated with craft techniques, particularly fishermen's nets and um, cages for capturing fish, uh, where, you know, it's a very, it's like lobster traps that we might make in this country where, you know, it's easy for them to swim in and then very difficult to get out. But he's taken this kind of weaving of rattan or bamboo and put it together into this bladder within a bladder shape so that it begins to manifest some of the same uh, bodily symbolism as what we see in Tim Hawkinson or in another way in Kiki Smith. And here I, I think we have this final metamorphosis that we are giving up our conventional human identity and looking inside ourselves for something else. Not perhaps very Ovidian, but very contemporary. Thank you. So we're going to move now to the third session um, of the second grouping. Um, and I want to remind everybody that again, um, the exhibition, um, Metamorphoses Ovid According to Wally Reinhardt, remains on view through Saturday, uh, Thursday from 11 to 6 and Saturday from 11 to 5 p.m. So I really encourage you to come see it if you haven't yet. And now I want to bring up um, both Dennis Geronimus, from whom we heard earlier, and the artist um, Wally Reinhardt. Just a few words about uh, Wally Reinhardt. He was born in Washington Heights um, and grew up in Manhattan. Um, he only began seriously making art at the age of 49. His fascination with Ovid's monumental 15 books of poetry, however, was ignited earlier. While living in Rome in the 1970s with his late partner, Robert Kaiser, a Philadelphia-based painter who also taught at Temple University's campus in Rome, Wally, who is a voracious consumer of culture, art, of course, as well as opera, theater, and ballet, uh, took the opportunity to visit many museums. There he, in Rome and throughout Italy, he would inevitably encounter artistic interpretations of Ovid's work. He began his own ambitious project after returning to New York from Rome in 1984, titled Pages from Ovid's Metamorphoses, in reference, of course, to its literary origins. The series now encompasses some 200 illustrations of the epic poem, and he's still making more. Um, I also want to thank Dennis Geronimus for co-curating the exhibition with me. Um, his contributions to both the show and his publications were enormously enriched by his participation. So thank you both. Thank you, Wally. Thank you, Dennis. And now some more observations about the exhibition. So uh, in the spirit of Polyphemus and Orpheus, I will begin with a lament. Uh, ho hopefully no one will disembody me for, uh, for, for saying the following. Um, Wally, don't go anywhere. <laughs> this is about you. No, no, no. This is just a, a brief comment. My lament is that we're not actually in Wally's show. And uh, I, wish, I, I wish we could all be transported there. Um, but I ran up to my office, uh, like fleet-footed Diana, 
and um, pulled up some images that I hope you will appreciate seeing um, almost as much as actually stepping into the exhibition itself, especially the students in this room, because it, it shows uh, all the blood and, and sweat that, and time and, and thought and care that Lynn um, and all of the installation people, uh, including the framers, put into the, um, uh, not just the conception of the show that I was honored to, uh, to share with Lynn, but the actual installation and design uh, of this uh, magnificent um, exhibition. So uh, you'll, you'll see it actually metamorphose uh, in the next couple of images into the show that I hope if you haven't seen it already, you will take the, the chance to see in the next two days because it closes already um, by uh, end of Saturday. So uh, I'm, I'm leading you virtually uh, in a way through the exhibition because as soon as you round the turn uh, on the left wall, you see this uh, um, cubist rendition uh, of Wally's of poor Medusa, who was once one of the most beautiful maidens, uh, but was of course transformed by the cruel gods into, uh, uh, the Gargon was uh, trans, uh, transformed along with her sisters into uh, the horrible snake-headed Medusa. And then once you round that yellow wall, uh, the final wall of uh, the, the final space of the exhibition is um, that which you see here. So again, this is very much in process, and I hope it's whetting your appetite uh, for the show if you haven't yet seen it, or reminding you of all of its marvels if you have. And there's Wally virtually, and here we have Wally in the flesh. And um, shall we have a chat? Okay. So, can everyone hear me? Okay. So maybe to begin at the beginning, uh, we've heard so much in the talks that have preceded our conversation about how visually evocative, how intensely pictorial uh, the Metamorphoses is as, a, as an epic poem. At the same time, we've also um, seen a number of painted poems or poesia by the likes of Titian and, 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 and Poussin and, and uh, Anibale as well. Um, one question that I haven't had a chance to ask you and Lynn as well, because Lynn and I had the privilege of interviewing you for the exhibition catalog, which was immensely fun. But one thing that occurred to me while listening to some of the talks this morning was how you came to the Metamorphoses as a, as a poem, whether it was with an old um, edition of the, of the poem itself, or perhaps during your trip to Rome, uh, was it a sculpture by Bernini at the Villa Borghese that actually got you thinking about the text. Was it, was it the text or, or another artist like yourself? Well, it, it was ago? pictures first. Um, it, I lived in Rome for two years and traveled around Europe, and I saw a lot of uh, Ovidian subjects in, in museums. And so I, that just... Uh, just stated in me. I didn't do anything about it. And, but I, and then I was pushing 50 back in the United States. And I thought, well, I've got to do something that's, or maybe I, I thought I could do something important. Time will tell. But uh, so I didn't want it to be about me. And Ovid, who was, uh, uh, he was illustrated uh, during the Renaissance and up until the middle of the 19th century copiously, but no more. And the poem still had uh, frequent translations and into English, and nobody else was doing it. And there was a history of, of, the illus of illustrating of it. So I thought, well, I'll do it. <laughs> and I... I never thought whether I could do it or not. I just started simply, and then when I needed to get more complicated, I was able to. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to read the, the exhibition catalog and, and Matthew's introduction, uh, may or may not know that this project is a 37, approximately, uh, year project that actually hasn't concluded yet, it hasn't ended, that it's an ongoing fascination. Yes, and, uh, um, uh, and it'll all wind up here at NYU. 
which I'm, I'm so relieved that, <laughs> As are we, that, that it's got a nice protective home. So again, to return to the beginning, I, um, I also have the, the, the letter here that I hope you're not too embarrassed that I, that I read from that you wrote in fall of 2016. Oh, no, no. That was the very genesis of the show and that Lynn quoted from uh, when, when this event began uh, this afternoon. Uh, but after, the, after the, the opening paragraph of this letter in which you, you, you say that, in, in which you mention that your deficit, um, as you call it, of a classical education, in fact, worked and continues to work in your favor because you only had uh, Ovid speaking to you uh, instead of necessarily constantly Picasso or, or uh, Piero Polawallo or whoever it might be. But then you also continue, uh, if I may read from this letter, to say uh, very interesting things about perhaps maybe the, the difference between translating and, and recreating something or re-envisioning Ovid in your own language. You're right, uh, I'm a museum goer where I've found a lot of Ovidian subjects magnificently addressed. Alas, they were from the past. The poem is still frequently translated, but artists ignore it. Of course, Ovid's poetry, like all poetry, is impossible to capture in another or spoken language. However, the illustrator, like other translators, can capture the vivid and funny characters in their predicaments. He must endeavor to keep the Ovidian fun and to substitute the poetry of his medium. Um, could you maybe speak a bit more about, about the, the substitution of, of Ovid's verses uh, for the medium of, in, in your particular case, of, uh, of uh, colored pencil or gouache? Or um, do, do you find that you're in conversation with him rather necessarily than translating a particular Well, tale? it's about his stories and characters. And that's... That's the only thing that a translator can do. He can't, trans, he can't trans, poetry is poetry, and it can tell a story, and that's what you can use as an illustrator. You can't, there's, there's no reason to translate, I mean, there is a re, it's, um, well, I, don't, I, I think it's, pretty impossible to capture all of it in English, for instance. Well, one of the, in fact, one of the questions from earlier today was about, I, I can't quite remember who in the audience asked it, but it was about uh, particular translations and which one, um, I think it was Katerina had, had used in, in her work. Or um, Lynn and I both noticed that, and, and I'm sure as you have all noticed in, in seeing the exhibition, that you do include either quotations or something like subtitles in the, in captions, the borders or captions, 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 captions yeah. uh, on, on the white part of the arches paper. And some are what we might call rather archaic in that it seems like they were drawn from very early translations of a particular edition of Ovid. And others seem like they have a bit of Wally in them as well, that you're that, that it, they're very jazzy and sometimes quite funny and... Yeah, well that's the, major, the majority of them are mine. And a, a few I've taken from, but they're taken from translations, they're not taken from the poem. So, but basically it's me. Which, which translation? Because that might be a question that someone has. Well, uh, that, that Slavid, you know. if I, I, I got the pregnant, I think I got the pregnant Ariadne from Sla, David Slavid. Who's, who did a, who's transla whose book I've used a lot. And so if I, so if any particularly good ones, they're probably by him, not me. See, there are art historians, maybe some graduate, intrepid graduate students in the audience right now who are now going to be writing about you translating Ovid. So they're, they're writing David oh, Slavin okay. is the, is the, for a footnote of some sort. So uh, something else that I wanted to bring up uh, and something that was certainly very important to, to Ovid himself is music. Um, and I know that that, uh, along yeah. with comics, that's another thing, yeah. and, and Pepe's talk made me think of comics as well. Um, can you also speak about influences beyond the, the more obvious ones that are visual and otherwise, uh, like music? I know you're, you love theater and opera. Well, yeah, I love, I, and I, for one thing, I try to get, 
music into any way. I, I always aim to get some music into, every, into all the illustrations with uh, uh, pooty bands and, uh, and um, let's see. And sometimes I try to get noise in because Ovid requests it. It's part of the story. And, uh, but, and I, I love music and I'm not musical. But Stravinsky said that uh, pay attention to uh, the design and emotional will, will follow. So I believe that from a, and he's a great composer. So I'm following. You know, I'm trusting what he, his instructions, and I do pay attention to the form or the design or the composition. And uh, trusting that <laughs> that uh, uh, mean, uh, that emotion and meaning will seep out of the the pictures. So they're they're, they're compositions and if they're senses. if they're composed well enough yeah. or staging. <laughs> yes. Well, so speaking of noise, because. Um, both Lynn and I were very drawn to your dogs. You, we, 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 we concluded even before without speaking to you that you're a dog person because there are very few felines. Yeah, and but I do like, I th I, yeah, I like cats too, but I, they, <laughs> I've never been able to use one actually. Yeah. Oh, lions. Oh, true. Yeah, so. Yeah. With Hercules, the story of Hercules. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Louise uh, showed Poussin's Kingdom of Flora that features two beautiful hounds, I think next to it, uh, Adonis, right, yeah. the, at the far right. And your dogs, your multicolored dogs, um, actually have, have these uh, almost kind of barking bubbles. Uh, many of your compositions are very cacophonous. They're, they're, they're noisy uh, stages. At, at the behest of Ovid, because right. that's the story. I mean, it's part of the story. And, and, and it almost seems like the, the barks actually have particular colors. Well, well. yeah. And they're, they're usually uh, violet, do violet and white dogs, and they bark big orange balloons. So, <laughs> so you know they're noisy. Right. Um, also, something something of uh, potential interest to to everyone here is also the. I, I know this is a sensitive topic for for any artist, which is influence. Um, but in terms of, uh, I guess what we could call a a local or vernacular influence that, uh, that, that any artist is subject to living in a, in a, in a cacophonous city like New York. Um, it, it, it seems that parks, potentially subways, we had this conversation about um, mosaics and tiles. Um, uh, also characters, uh, almost the kind of cast of Fellini as characters that we see on the subway or, or walking down the street. <laughs> Can you speak a bit more about, about just the influence of the everyday and the way that you make Ovid relevant for yourself? That it, this, is, this isn't just a, uh, a, uh, an, an ancient text, but a very contemporary, potentially a very, very contemporary text. I think I'm less quiet? cerebral than that. Uh, and uh, I don't know how I started exactly, but as I made more and more of them, I think I'm my own, my greatest influence, you know. That's very Michelangelo-esque. Oh, okay. Auto Autodidactic right. you know. element. And, I, and, and it, from the beginning, it was based on earlier art. And, and I don't think that art, to be, I think that art to be art has to be based on art. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and um, so the, yeah, that's that's yeah. what I think. Well, because I, I'm also thinking right now a number of your um, uh, almost kind of signature compositions. One of which uh, is installed right at the very entrance of of the galleries before one yeah. descends, is um, is distinguished by by this uh, billowing red sail, and it's the story of Dionysus, um, and D Dionysus and Selenus uh, appear and reappear throughout yes, th yes. throughout your narratives. And um, in some of the Dionysian scenes, uh, one actually sees sailors that, that look like modern, you know, in, in terms of their sailors' hats. And, yeah, and things like the, that. I just couldn't help using sailors' hats uh, on the dolphins. They turn the sailors are changed to dolphins, and so I, so they're swimming around with sailors' hats. 
you know. So speaking, <laughs> I couldn't actually, resist that. And hmm? the dolphins have human arms. Oh, the, yeah, well, like, they're they're still changing. They're still metamorphosing. Yeah, yeah, they're us. still changing, and, and uh, there were three of these big square ones, and some of them uh, dolphins offer fish to to Bacchus and stuff like that. And uh, Salinas is a wonderful pot-bellied, yeah, uh, an idealized and, and, character. And uh, Bacchus, uh, I've I quite often shown Bacchus being carried by Salinas. And uh, I've heard that, uh, you know, that Ovid never said that, but he doesn't give stage directions, so you can do it any way, you, whatever, you know, the way you want. So back to the, back to the sailors, not only are they wearing uh, modern day hats. Yeah, uh, I mean, do they still wear those hats? I don't see them over. <laughs> on on it's shore leave. Second World War. Yeah. Sailors. Yeah, they're not completely yeah. contemporary. They're yeah. modern, I should say. But other than the hats, for those of you who remember, they're actually wearing nothing else. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, there's very little clothing in my illustrations. Right. So, on that note, because Ovid himself is not just a visually evocative, but also a very sexually provocative uh, poet, um, I would love to hear more uh, about about that dimension of your work, because, and we've spoken about this before, that uh, there are both many scenes in, in your ongoing series that are very violent. Uh, other images are both violent and tender at the same time. But one of the late motifs that is really th stitched throughout all of your works is this, not even, I would say, latent, but very overt sexuality. Um, and, and, it's, and it's also part of the violence and part of the humor, depending on depending on the myth and the way that you interpret it, if maybe you could speak a bit about that element of your work. Uh, well. So for those of you who haven't seen the show, there's a lot of sex in it, so <laughs> you, better, you better go just for that reason as well. No, it's, my, it's my attention to the compositions that bring out everything you say. And, and uh, I do have to have an idea about the picture before I start it. But I, as I think that, you know, just honing it and making, you know, making it into a good image, and then those things are wow. evident. So that, that makes me think of one of the works that arrives very late in the exhibition, but it's, it's one of the earlier works that you had executed. So again, for those of you who haven't had a chance to to, to, to experience the exhibition yet. It's organized by uh, each one of the 15 books of the Metamorphoses. So it moves through the poem uh, sequentially, but uh, many of the works that come at the beginning, because they're from book 14 or 15, in fact, were executed in the early 80s, early to mid 80s. Yeah, I just, I, I, it, I, I the, the, pro, the, the hard thing is getting the idea. And I would just remember or pick a, and go through the poem until I got something that interested me to do that, or I found pictorial, or I, I could think of a, a pictorial way to present it. And so I've been in every book, but I think I've only, some of them only once or twice. And the, in the beginning, I think I did the fall of faith and, you know, 20 times when I was learning, you know, or figuring out what I was doing. And uh, so what was the question? Well, so in, w w I was about to mention uh, the Polyphema series from, oh, from yeah. the 1980s that arrives very late in the exhibition, but is one of the earlier, um, I think it's a trio of images that, that we show yeah, in, well, in the show. On yeah, the end wall. And Asus and Galatea yeah. and Polyphemus. Uh, and well, I mean, he, he, he's sort of, he's in an opera by Handel that I like. And uh, he, he's been, you know, he's well known. But I, I'm the, the, I haven't seen another, poly, another artist's polyphemus with only one eye uh, in the forehead. They all give him a, a usual facial structure with two eyes, and then there's an extra eye in the forehead, so, and I think of him as vain, I, I, you know, and he's looking, he's grooming himself, 
and looking in his, at his reflection and being pleased with what he sees. So I thought he was a wonderful character. He seems like one of your many, uh, to me, lovable monsters because yeah. he, he seems altogether human and what you said earlier about coming to particular pictorial decisions in the, in the process of composing the larger composition. The, this particular story that you illustrate shows a tremendous amount of attention to the figure of Polyphemus itself to the point that he even has a lot of body hair. I, I remember. Uh, he, yeah, no, he was more. Body. I guess he was more interesting than either Asus or Galatea, yeah. uh, and I mean Galatea, he's crushed by by Polyphemus, and uh, then uh, Galatea is, is is a nymph or something, and she can bring him back, but it's only as a stream. So. You, uh, and uh, that's that. That was uh, I enjoyed uh, showing him as a as a, he, he. I showed him as a green sculpture and every orifice, like a fountain actually. And her, very sadly, looking at what she as much as she could do. Yeah, it's a beautiful scene. Um, at, at some point, you make a technical shift, a, a transition from um, colored pencil to, to gouache um, on Arches paper. And one thing that appears that, to my knowledge, I don't think appears or appears with uh, all that much frequency in the earlier, smaller scaled works in colored pencil are stars. And this is something that seems extremely important to your work. It's maybe easy to miss. Um, with one just focuses on, a, on one particular diptych or triptych, but as one makes her way or his way through the show, all, all of your stars are different. Made, it, made me actually think of the starry-eyed Apollo when he sees Daphne, when he's struck by the, by the, by the, by the arrow of Cupid, that he's actually literally starry-eyed when, when he sees and begins his chase of Daphne. Uh, I didn't realize until recently that they were all night pictures with starry skies, and the, f the figures became gradually more and more neoclassic and, and white, uh, like uh, uh, Della Robbia sculptures. And so it was the, 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 the dark blue starry background was just perfect. And, and I always liked to draw stars when I was a kid, too, so it's, okay. it's just something I've carried through life. And I, I'm not sure if we have enough time for maybe another question or two. I'm sure many of you have questions for, for Wally himself. But um, this is a question that every art historian uh, dreads. So I'm not sure if I should ask you or not. But uh, Well, I'm not an art historian. Or, and, well, I'm a former <laughs> artist. I just don't have uh, time to do it anymore. But so, so maybe I, maybe I can, uh, I can uh, brave this question. But uh, what's next, meaning? Uh, obviously, this poem is of infinite fascination to you. It's it's boundlessly rich in, in possibilities. Um, Fifteen books. Yes. Fifteen books. Um, uh, what what are you planning now? Now that you've had this exhibition, and obviously you're you're still working and reworking your ideas as to how to translate Ovid visually. What would you like to I, experiment? I, I mean, with next? I, um, I've started. There were uh, two square ones in this show. And then I, I did three in all, and early. That was the first way I put together the pages in a, a, a 30, what is it? It's uh, 36 by 33, it comes out, of an almost square thing. And that was my first way to, do, and I did three of them. And it was my first way to put the pages together in a narrative. Then I discovered that you could put the pages narratively one after like a scroll and that's the way i've been doing them ever since but now the the last two i did and i'm working on a third one are squares again and i think it's a kind of uh, a more complicated or interesting narrative because it's not you know it's it just and it's more like you know opera where three four things go on together at, at the same time so, so I've been very happy working with squares again.
And that's, uh, and it's all Ovid, and it's all the metamorphoses. I mean, there are 15 books, and it'll carry me to, to the end, you know. <laughs> And it really, you know, it's the only thing I've ever been interested in, in, in making illustrations for. You know. um, and uh, so I'm going to continue. Great. Well, and they'll have a home. Thank you for that. And I'll watch it. <laughs>